Hi, everyone. We will get started in just a moment. Welcome as folks come in from the waiting room. All right, I can see folks joining us now. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll get started in just a moment. All right, welcome everybody. We'll get started in just All right. Well, hello, everybody. It's Wednesday at noon, so it means it's time for our weekly Wednesday webinar. I'm Sarah Hanewald, Assistant Head of School at One Schoolhouse for Professional Development and New Programs. And today I have a really interesting guest with me today. I know I say that a lot. This one's going to be really good. So we have uh, Dr. Tori Cordiano from the Laurel School, who is also a clinical psychologist in private practice. And I'm just gonna share some slides and then we will get started on our conversation. So welcome, Tori. Well, thank, thank you, thank you for having me. And I do wanna remind everybody that we do have closed captioning available. And so if you would like to turn those on, that's ready for you. And then if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A. We left time for questions because I knew folks would have them. And so we're going to talk today about how when we build trust with parents and guardians, that's actually one of the ways that we support our students in our communities. And uh, Dr. Cordiano is the Director of Research for Laurel School's Center for Research in Girls. And she's also a culti uh, consulting psychologist at the Laurel School in Shaker Heights for about 12 years there, Tori, right? You've been there? Yep, that's right. This is my 12th year. Great. So, so you know it all. You, you've almost graduated. You've got one more year, right? <laughs> right. Well, we have a pre-primary too, so <laughs> a few oh, okay. more. A couple more years. Then. Um, so on our blog, I wrote a post this week called What Should They See? And that's about what we might consider in terms of sharing insights and not just information. I mean, everybody last year just did such an overhaul of systems and technology and getting... Uh, access to families back home. And so think about, well, what, what should we keep sharing? Uh, next week's webinar, we're gonna talk about parent education. Uh, if you are not on the Academic Leaders Listserv, I cannot recommend it enough. There have been some really insightful conversations over the last week around placement and how schools organize professional learning for teachers. So if you're wondering how to join that, you can go to our website and Sienna will drop the link in the chat as well. And you can hop on and join the listserv. If you're not getting emails from One Schoolhouse, we send out a newsletter every week and we'd love to share information with you. If you go to our blog, you can <clears throat> sign up for our email system. We don't ever share your email outside of One Schoolhouse and um, we would love to have you as part of our community. So every week we do a poll. And this week we asked, what information about students' classroom experience do you make available to parents and guardians? And we wanted to look at 2019 versus 2021. And it's pretty interesting. Tori, you and I were talking about this just before the webinar started. And you know, I sort of, we sort of had a chuckle like, who, who was it who wasn't sharing final grades in 2019, <laughs> right? Because somebody indicated that in 2020, they were switching, they were sharing more of that, but perhaps they weren't doing it online. Maybe they were doing that via email or something like that. But so what really seems to have changed is this, you know, the detail level, the interaction, the, the extra information, the descriptions of the assignment, maybe opportunities for teachers to share, you know, a conversational video or really offer a connection that way. So there's definitely been some change there. I am going to stop sharing. And do you mind telling everybody just a little bit about you and how you came to this work? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So um, as Sarah said, I am a clinical psychologist by training. Um, I uh, have, and this is my 12th year at Laurel School. Laurel is a 
pre-primary, um, co-ed co pre-primary, and then a K through 12 girls school. Um, so I wear a couple of different hats there. I am a consulting psychologist, which means I consult with um, faculty um, and staff. I am in the classroom doing some social emotional teaching. I teach health and wellness in the upper school. Um, I meet with parents, I meet with girls. So I do lots of different sort of- Yeah. Things. yeah. <laughs> um, help manage a lot of the learning needs um, for girls who have learning differences or who are on learning plans. And then the other um, role that I have at Laurel School is that I'm the director of research for our Center for Research on Girls. Um, so in that role, I help to coordinate um, research studies that happen both internally and uh, when we collaborate with outside researchers. I help with student-led research, um, faculty who want to conduct research. So it's a really cool way to stay involved um, in research without uh, having it in an, like an academic, um, you know, college type role, but um, still getting to do so much of that research. So we have um, over the years, lots of peer reviewed uh, journal articles in a variety of different areas, everything from eating disorders to outdoor pre-primary education. Um, and then we do a lot of in-house research. And, and we also think about what's the best research out there right now that other people are doing and how do we bring it to the ground for our students in our school community? Oh, okay. That's really interesting. And we'll probably dive into that a little bit too. So as you and I were getting ready for this conversation and then in looking at the pulse results. So for the past 18 months, depending on, you know, how a school was operating and how a family was comfortable, parents and guardians had some real side-by-side -side access. Let me see what you're doing for the last 18 months. And that lasted for a long time. And now it's time to send your child to school and not everyone feels really comfortable. So what's your take on the transition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's it's funny to think back to late March 2020, and it seems like it was a you know different world in many ways of just sort of starting to understand how we could help students in that way when they're learning from home. And so many parents were just thrust into that role, um, really uncertain about what that was look, going to look like, and just really kind of in partnership with schools took on the challenge to support their their kids. Um, so what it meant is that parents had a front row seat to their child's learning in a way that they did not before. And many of them really probably didn't think about needing a front row seat or, or wanting a front row seat. It, you know, they were checking in in ways that felt appropriate with teachers and when their kids were home, but not knowing everything that they were doing throughout the school day. Um, and it was necessary in many circumstances for parents to step into that role as children were managing hybrid learning or online learning and through last year as well because many students were still on many students were still online last year um, at least for the bulk of the year um, so it became necessary for parents to get more into the nitty-gritty details of what was happening on a daily basis and now we're at a place where most students are now back in person um, in many parts of the country, most parts of the country perhaps. Uh, and so it's almost a little bit like a, a separation. Um, and if you think back to when you first sent your kids to school and what that separation was like, and you're sort of letting them go and no one kind of planned to like pull them back and then let them go again, but that's sort of where we are. And so some of those same issues uh, may be coming up in terms of letting go of the model that uh, was kind of cobbled together and, and worked um, in the ways that it needed to over the past year and a half. And now we're on to something different. Yeah, you know, um, so one of the things that we talked about during the last 18 months and so is that there was some regression for children, right? In times of stress, people's developmental levels go down a little bit. And so parents might have really had to help with executive functioning in ways that in school that wouldn't have happened. And so how does, how could that be appropriate? And yet now it's time to back up, but a family or guardian might say, you know what, I saw that my kid really needed this executive functioning support. Mm -hmm. And so how do, how do we kind of navigate that? It's a really interesting question because I think we're seeing many things kind of intersect here. Um, part of it is that in school, if students were struggling with how to get started or understand the directions, um, and this was pre-COVID, you know, they were in school and, and just have sort of had it in front of them, many of them might have felt frustrated and then might have sat with it, grappled with it a little bit and kind of maybe asked a question or figured it out and kind of pushed through and got started, maybe made some mistakes and figured out how to tweak it. So some students were able to do that. And what's interesting about when it's happening at home, if a, if a parent is close by and a student is getting frustrated, 
many parents feel like the frustration was, oh, okay, now I need to help. I need to, to come in and help you figure this out. And also because of the circumstances, the frustration went higher quicker. And so students really were feeling so much more frustrated than they would have at school. They're also home with their safe people and you know their parents and they're able to kind of let that out a little bit more. And so parents were more hands-on. Um, and it, it, it was just the way that it worked and probably needed to work in a lot of circumstances. But what it meant is that students may have, have um, for some students may have lost a little bit of that ability to kind of sit with it and grapple um, through some of those challenges that they were getting a lot of support at home. It also maybe made clear for some parents areas where their child may be struggling with regard to executive functioning. You know, it might have been feedback that they had been getting from the school, uh, but not quite understanding what that was looking like. And now they may have understood, oh, I see how it's hard for him to get started on the work, or she's not quite understanding how to chunk out those directions to, to know what she's supposed to do. Um, so for some parents, it gave them more insight into it. Um, so it can go in both ways. I think for some students, they're coming back actually with stronger skills in that area if they were managing more of it on their own. Um, for some students who were getting a whole lot of support at home in managing it and not a lot of room to kind of get frustrated and grapple with it, they may be coming in with some more room to grow with regard to those skills. That's really interesting. And so, you know, teachers who have been through some really grueling months are now you know, having to navigate that again with a group of students and maybe certainly our kindergarten teachers are excellent at that, right? They know how to take a room full of kids who have a very different skill set in terms of how to go to school and, and pull them together. But we might not be used to that in seventh grade and 10th grade, some of those other grade levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think it, that variability, you know, you see that coming into every grade and you always have new students coming in, but you generally expect if the students were at your school last year, they all had kind of the same general experience if they were at school. But if all of them were online or a portion of them were online um, and there has been a lot more movement between schools um, over the last year. So you really may be getting more of a mixed bag uh, that you're trying to kind of figure out where everybody is and what they need these, these first weeks of the school year. So, so what do parents and guardians and caregivers need from schools when they're feeling this anxiety around, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure we're really ready to go back or I'm not sure my child's ready for this. How can, how can school leaders really navigate that a little bit better? Yeah, I think it's a lot of it has to do with striking a balance and understanding and acknowledging that parents are coming back this year um, uncertain, maybe scared to send their kids back, worried about what this year is going to look like. Um, for many different reasons. Um, and part of that is because they were they may have been much more involved over the last year. Um, so the communication between school and home becomes really, really key. And the form that that communication takes and the essence of it. So there's partly the reassurance that the school systems are in place. Um, they have always been predictable and structured and consistent for kids, which we know is the environment in which they thrive. Um, and schools have used this last you know, year and a half to become incredibly flexible and resourceful and to figure out how to really kind of tweak their systems even better. So they, they're, most schools are coming in with very strong systems um, for meeting students where they are this year. Um, but it takes a certain amount of trust uh, between schools and parents or caregivers for parents to be able to kind of hand their kids off into that and trust that that is what is happening and that they can drop their child off and know that they're getting what they need during the school day and that it's appropriate now to take more of a step back now that they are back in school in person. Yeah, so safety is one of the often cited reasons that parents give for choosing independent schools for their children. And what you just described to me sounds like a, a different level of safety too, right? It's not just that, you know, we're cleaning and, you know, we're a caring community, but you're talking about systems that, that build emotional safety and academic safety and all of those are in place as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the values of private schools and, and why many parents choose them is this idea that your child is known, right, by, by adults in the school. And 
they are, you know, someone's noticing if things are a little off or a little different. Um, that certainly was happening last year still, but I know it felt hard to connect when you weren't in, in person together. Um, so parents may have been doing more kind of communicating to the school or more taking on that, that work that might have been shared with the school. And so now that students are back in school, it's kind of trusting that that is happening in the ways that it always has happened in our schools. Right. And, and maybe just making it really, really clear things that were understood. I know y'all talk a lot at Laurel School about, you know, if your system was based on proximity, how, how are ways that you can make it more explicit and communicate it? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think one way that we think about that is lots of different touch points and lots of different ways of accessing it. So this year, still, many of our events are still virtual, you know, probably most of them. We have parent coffees um, that happen periodically through the year um, that, that are happening virtually. But things like, you know, curriculum night um, is something that will happen in person this year. Um, so there are, are ways that people are able to come together in person and ways that many people are still going to be doing it virtually. Some of those are large groups, um, maybe even as large as whole school groups, some are by division, some are by grade level. And then we have lots of opportunities for one-on-one -on -one, um, touch points as well, whether it's with faculty, um, with a division leader, with one of our psychologists at the school. Um, so parents feel like there are lots of options for communication, depending on what they need and the type of communication they're looking for. Yeah, I think that's really important. I like the way that you've described sort of that spectrum of options for how to connect and how to communicate. And then what do y'all do to make it easy for parents to schedule time with a counselor if they really wanna have that one-on-one -on -one conversation? Yeah, well, we're really lucky at Laurel that we have four um, clinical psychologists, one who's there full time and three of us who are a consulting psychologist. And I know not every school has that level of support, but most have at least, um, you know, a school counselor, a school psychologist available. Um, and we make a point to be very visible and very transparent to students and to families. Uh, we have switched over, actually, we switched over um, during last year so that our consulting psychologist uses the Calendly link, which is Ah. fantastic and like the easiest way to schedule um so it's making it it's made it so much easier not just even for um, parents to schedule with us but for students to schedule a quick pop in because they can sort of just see when we're available um but many many parents now um you know we're, we're meeting with them virtually as opposed to in person and it just actually feels quite a bit easier for them to reach us and to quickly connect and to get a, a quick meeting. It might only even be 15 minutes, just a quick check-in um, on the calendar. Um, and then we do have points where we have, you know, the psychologist will lead like a parent coffee or um, a, a grade level, you know, kind of talk for a group of parents on a certain subject. Um, but we, we have these options for smaller check-ins that many parents take advantage of as well. All right, so I have a whole bunch of questions coming to <laughs> mind at once, so I'm just going to work my way through and we'll see where the conversation takes us. Sometimes people get discouraged if just four or five people come to something mm -hmm. that they have put out there, but it sounds like you intentionally want groups that are larger, groups that are smaller, and then opportunities for one-on-one. -on -one. Do you see real value there? We do. And this has been a really interesting evolution. I mean, none of us knew what to expect the first time we hosted a Zoom coffee, right? <laughs> Once we got past the technical piece of like, okay, is everyone in the right spot? You know, we had some groups where we had uh, more than half of the parents in the grade join us. And we had others where we would have three or four or five parents there. And we held the space, you know, we prioritized that space for what parents need. For us, the space was going to be held no matter what. And so we had a plan for, okay, what will this look like if we if we get 20 people? What will this look like if we get 10 people? What will this look like if we get a handful of people? And of course, the time of it might be different. We might meet for a shorter period of time if it's a smaller group mm -hmm. of people, but there's a certain comfort level within those smaller groups um, where parents might feel a little bit freer to ask questions or to kind of go deeper on a subject. Um, obviously, if there's more than one parent there, we're not talking about specific students. We're keeping it more broad level and encouraging Encouraging them to follow up individually if they'd like to talk about their specific student, but it does kind of take it into a direction that feels very meaningful and valuable for parents. If it's a smaller group, they can ask questions about things that they might not be able to um, or even feel comfortable doing in a much bigger crowd. I think that's a great point. And when you are putting together kind of your, your year-long plan for touch points, do you have themes that are defined and advertised? Like how do you, how do you do the scheduling topics, that kind of thing? 
Mm -hmm. um, we're pretty flexible around it. And, uh, and most of the credit here goes to our um, division leaders and our, you know, by each division, uh, because they really have their finger on the pulse of what's happening. So for example, this year, we talked over the summer a little bit about, you know, what are some topics we'd want to address, but really we didn't quite know what was going to be coming up. So we, you know, kind of keep it broad enough that um, we can move it in one direction or another. Um, you know, if we, last year, we, for example, we thought at the beginning of year, we might have a lot of difficulty with um, separation in our youngest kiddos, our pre-primary kiddos. And it actually turned out that they were able to separate overwhelmingly fantastic. And so we didn't need to spend a lot of time on separation and we could switch that topic to something else related to social emotional development in the preschool set. Um, so we like to have it be flexible enough. And we have a team that has been working together um, pretty closely um, for long enough that we can be, you know, kind of more flexible in the in the days or a week leading up to, say, a parent coffee or a parent talk. Okay, that so that makes a lot of sense. And then you've also alluded to sometimes we're in person, sometimes we're virtual. And I know that there's a lot about virtual that folks are liking. I mean, I get to talk to you because we're all very adept now with with virtual connecting. But you know. How do you spell out when do you need to do something virtually? When do you want to be in person? What are the, you know, from, from your area of expertise, right? And you're talking about really building a trusting relationship, having somebody feel connected. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that? Mm -hmm. This has been really tricky. And I think we like the idea of having both options for both um, when it's safe and reasonable to have, um, you know, options where we're people can come together. One of the things that we miss, uh, you know, I, for having done these coffees for years and years, you would see at the end, we would be done. And, you know, the, the faculty would actually be sort of on their way out and parents would stay and kind of linger. And, you know, if there's a new parent there, they might make a connection with somebody or, you know, you saw these connections happening quite organically. And I think that's hard over Zoom. It feels much more, you're kind of in, you get the information and you're out and it's, that's part of the beauty of it. It's quick and easy and you can, you know, do it while you're doing something else, even if you have to, um, if you're a parent tuning in, but we miss that connection piece of it. So I think at, at Laurel, and I'm sure many schools are doing the same thing. We've tried to find ways that are safe to connect in person. And sometimes that involves the whole family. Like we had an ice cream social, um, you know, the first week of school and we could do it outdoors. We'll have a, you know, movie night at our outdoor campus. So some of those are just more social events that can kind of um, make up for some of the things that would normally be happening if parents were gathering in person. Um, and then over the Zoom piece of it, we have encouraged parents to um, kind of, you know, stay on, um, you know, after we're kind of done with whatever topic we're talking about, if they have specific questions they want to ask about, and sometimes we'll have, you know, points of connection there as well. You know, you make a really good point about that and it's come up a couple of times, right? Students sometimes can look around the classroom and see what other students are doing if they missed a cue. And parents in a coffee can say, oh, you know, your daughter's in this grade too. And, and you know, maybe I had a younger child there. Here's something that we did last year that helped. That kind of, those casual conversations that can really be supportive. And we lost some of that. And so now we're back in a situation where kids, can be getting some of that back in. And you might have to think about how do we help parents back out of some of the weeds? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And this is where the, the trust, the communication and trust becomes really important because if you can trust that the systems are in place and your, your student is getting what they need at school, you can feel more comfortable kind of backing off and letting that student try it out and work it out with their teacher at school. Um, but I think, you know, just some grace all around. So grace for parents who were had had to be really in the weeds last year and or longer than last year and now are sort of abruptly not and, and don't want to be and but having are having a hard time kind of pulling back from that. And for students who are transitioning to this new environment and for teachers who are taking on the sort of the transition from what it was like to teach these students remotely to now in person and you know the parent communication piece being different when it was remote versus in person. Um, so I think coming from a place of like just a whole lot of grace all around for everybody and the idea that you know we're, we're all at, at Laurel we, we constantly talk about keeping the child at the center right and so that's what we're thinking here and remembering that parents are not asking for this access because they want to check up on teachers or want to know what they're doing. They're, they just want to know that their child is getting what they need and that they are, you know, safe and comfortable and able 
able to access their learning that they that they need. Um, and, and teachers want children to be able to learn and to develop these skills that actually require a little bit more autonomy and a little bit more of kind of trying it out and making mistakes and figuring it out on their own, um, you know, at a developmentally appropriate level, depending on their grade. Super important. So we've been thinking about strategically, you know, where we want relationships to go and how we want to move forward. Can we get a little bit tactical now? So you've got a parent, they seem like they're struggling with this, maybe they're upset or anxious, and you've got a meeting scheduled for that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach that one-on-one -on -one conversation in a way that supports you and supports the family relationship with the school? Yeah. I, I, anytime we're going into a parent meeting and whether it, it feels like it's going to be very neutral or there's some expectation that maybe it will be less than neutral, um, you know, I always make an effort to, to kind of put the frame of mind of we want to come in with curiosity. We just want to come in curious, right? We want to kind of just see where people are and ask questions and truly listen to what parent concerns are. Um, we try really hard as a school and I personally try really hard to avoid kind of jumping to reassurances or promises or things about, okay, here's what we'll do or jump in quickly with a plan because we can often kind of get ahead of ourselves in that way. Um, so we wanna save some time to think about what are the action steps going to be, but we really first wanna come in with you know, how are you? How is your child? What's going well? What's feeling hard? What are your concerns? Um, and to truly listen uh, to their answers and, and to hear not only the words that they're saying, but kind of like this is where the in-person part misses it a little bit. Zoom gets it. Uh, phone often misses it completely. But you know, the tone of their voice and their body language and the things that are telling you they're coming, you know, they're saying it in kind of a, a short voice, but they're really just, you can see the tension um, of, of being concerned about their child. And so we're trying to really take in all of that and then collaborate with them to kind of stand side by side with them and, and look at what's in front uh, and figure out, okay, what, what are the next steps that we can kind of put in place to support uh, your student? You know, I really like that framework of opening with curiosity and thinking about that that way. What about when, you know, during the course of the conversation or maybe ahead of time, you know that, ooh, someone in the school has made a mistake mm -hmm. and you know, we're all human. Mm -hmm. It is such a, you know, crazy time right now for everybody in terms of people are tired and overstretched and that need for grace that you mentioned, I think is really important, but, but how do you go about repairing that connection? Yeah. I like that word repair. I mean, I think that's the way that we you know, need to come into it with first an acknowledgement of what has happened and a sincere apology if that is the next step that should happen. Um, and that really takes a lot of work on the school's end before going into the conversation of really kind of figuring out, okay, where did this go off course? What happened? How do I you know, kind of figure out what I might do differently? How do I do this repair? kind of avoiding the defensiveness that is a really common reaction when we've made a mistake. Um, but, but just kind of going in with that idea that uh, we want to acknowledge what happened. We want to apologize truly for what happened. We want to think with you about what we can do to repair uh, the relationship and, and to kind of do the, the next right thing uh, for your student. Yeah. And then what about communicating for follow-up? Can you just share an example of following up after a difficult conversation? Yeah. So again, I think this is um, hits at two points. The first is, you know, we can, we've all had this experience working, probably it's not exclusive to schools, but a really great meeting and then not a lot of follow-up, not a lot of next steps. So I think making a plan for follow-up at the end of, okay, we'll plan to send an email at the end of next week. Um, and I, I, because I feel like things might fall through my own cracks, I often will do a draft email that I'm scheduled to send. So it kind of pops up and reminds me, okay, this needs to happen today. Um, so having some systems in place for accountability there. Um, and then, you know, kind of making sure that that is scheduled and, and ready to go. The other piece about it is if you're meeting um, about a student and there's some area of concern concern, it may not be the first time that a parent has heard that feedback, right? And so we really make an effort to also communicate the things that we're seeing that are going really well. And this is for all our students, but I think it can feel particularly important if it's a student who 
maybe struggling. Um, you know, we saw this little moment today. We saw how hard she's working in English. We saw her, you know, really stay after and help pick up in PE, you know, whatever it is that we can just provide communication that is not just about the challenging points. And it kind of reinforces that idea that we know your child, we want to know your child and for all the parts of her, not just the parts that are, are hard. I think that's really important. I think you even called it cash in the bank one time, you know, yeah. that we really know your child, right? Yeah. So we, we've been looking, we're looking out for your kid and how important Ooh, that is. We've got a question here about, could you just describe a little bit about the structure? You mentioned the, the um, psychologist, but how do y'all, how do your student support groups meet is the question. Oh, um, well, it, a lot of this happens with our um, full-time in-house psychologist, who's also a clinical psychologist. Um, so she does a lot of the, um, we, we call them, our mascot is the gator. So we have to call gator aid uh, that they meet every, you know, and, and a rotation um, with our, I think that's with our K to five girls. Um, and so they will meet and cover social emotional topics um, in the upper school. It's health and wellness um, that's taught by the psychologist. Uh, and those are the times where we meet as a wider group. And then we have lots of points where we will connect individually with girls. Um, sometimes depending on what's coming up, you know, I may pop into a middle school class and um, talk about a specific topic and, you know, just depending on often social things that are, are coming up over the course of the year. Um, social issues and executive functioning tend to be the two areas where we provide a little bit more um, kind of touch points, especially with our middle schoolers. So I think what I really like about what I'm hearing you describe, and oh my gosh, we're out of time, but um, that you have systems, but they're systems that support the relationships and the warm personal interaction. So the system isn't necessarily entirely visible to those who are not responsible for a part of it. In fact, we're a little bit like that at our school. We have what I would call data-informed, warm personal interactions. We use our software to track how students are doing, and then you know, we go from there. And it sounds like y'all have really taken that to a, a really high level. So, thank you. I, I want do, to and I'm sorry, cutting out there for a second, it oh, might sorry. be on my end, but um, yes, we are, we try to be very, um, transparent uh, with families about the resources that are available. Um, at the beginning of the year, we always give a big push for connecting with the psychologists. Um, we are, you know, present at the curriculum night and different things throughout the year so that families know that we are a resource that we hope they take advantage of. That is great. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on today. This was really insightful and I really enjoyed thinking about these topics with you. You've got a, a real wealth of experience. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great conversation. Well, take care, everyone. We'll see you next week. And if you're watching the recording, look below and you'll see the links to the resources and the posts. Bye-bye.